Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 3120, Transition to Advanced Mathematics for Students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. So we are in the middle of our discussion of the principle of mathematical induction, which was introduced in the lecture 19. Um, induction is all about proving the truth values for a sequence of statements. That is, if we have a statement for each natural number, induction allows us to prove that for every natural number, the statement holds to be true. We do this by looking at a base case, and then with our inductive hypothesis, we assume it holds for the kth position, and then we argue that the kth position implies that the k plus one position is also true, and hence induction shows that it's true for all natural numbers. So induction is useful for proving sequences of statements to be true. And so in this lecture, I actually want to delve into this idea of a sequence leading to the notion of recursion, which is sort of like the, uh, the other side of this induction statement. Induction, you typically start small and go big, as opposed to recursion, you sort of are big and then move backwards. Uh, and I'll make that more explicit in just a second. So let's first make sure we understand what a sequence is. A sequence is an infinite list of numbers. Uh, indexed by a set of natural numbers. Now we've we've talked about lists before in this lecture series. Typically, we're talking about finite lists, which may have be they may be ordered, maybe they're unordered, maybe they have repetition, maybe they don't have repetition. This is an important problem for combinatorics. But a sequence is going to be a list of an infinite list, so it goes on forever and ever and ever. And typically, it'll be denoted. It will be indexed by the set of natural numbers, but a subset of the natural numbers might be very appropriate. Uh, for example, instead of using the set of natural numbers, which includes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., maybe you only index it using the positive integers because it could be that the number 0 itself might be problematic, like if you look at the harmonic sequence, for example. Uh, but that doesn't matter too much. We just have a subset of natural numbers that index here. Typically, we start with 0. Um, or one, depending on the circumstance there. And there's basically two ways that one typically describes a sequence, because after all, a sequence, you can think of the mathematics of a pattern. Um, some a pattern is established, and we want to describe that pattern. We want to understand and study that pattern. And so the two ways that we typically describe a sequence is, well, well, the first is that we have a general term. That is, we have like a formula for the nth position of the sequence. So let me offer you a few examples here. Suppose we have the sequence right here, one comma one third comma one ninth comma one twenty seventh comma one over eighty one. So each of the terms in the sequence looks like it's one over a power of three. Um, you could read back the first one as one over one, where of course one is the zero power, three is the first power, nine is the second power, twenty seven is the third power, eighty one is the fourth power. So in general, we could describe the terms of this sequence as the nth power of one third like so and so we have we have a term for every natural number right there and so this describes our general term uh the generic term of the sequence looks something like that now i do want to mention that this first sequence right here is an example of what we call a geometric sequence uh, geometric sequences are extremely important sequences uh, you do some study of these in calculus for example um, and basically, geometric sequence is kind of like a exponential function. Um, the general term will look exponential for a geometric sequence. Uh, we, I, we can give another definition recursively later on, but we'll just stick with that for right now. Uh, consider the following, the next sequence right here. We could take the sequence negative 1, 1, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13. This is the sequence of odd integers uh, for which we can describe the general term as 2n minus 1. Uh, this is actually a, an example of a more generic family, a more general family, what we call arithmetic sequences. Arithmetic sequences kind of are sequences that behave like linear functions. They'll have a formula that looks something like this, 2n minus 1. Now, in this situation, I did start my sequence with the zeroth term right here being negative 1. If that was somewhat unnatural, it might make sense to just start with the n equals 1 and only look at positive integers because maybe we only want the positive uh, we only want the positive uh, odd integers in that situation but be aware that any sequence that starts with one up to a change of index could also start with zero and vice versa so the difference between starting at one and starting at uh, negative one is somewhat of a arbitrary distinction it might change how the formula looks but after all if we were to change our sequence to do something like the following cn equals 2n plus one like so, that would start at 1, then 3, then 5, but then you would your index would be n equals 0, n equals 1, 
etc. So if you want your sequence to start at zero, you can do so. If you want your index set to be the entire set of natural numbers, you can always do so. Um, it honestly comes down to convenience at that point. Uh, another sequence we could consider, the sequence of squares, 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, etc. Uh, the general term would just be n squared in such a situation. Um, what about this sequence right here? Uh, e, comma, e squared over 2, e cubed over 3, e to the 4th over 4, e to the 5th over 5. When you look at that pattern right there, the first one could be rewritten to be e to the 1 over 1. Uh, the general term would look like e to the n over n. And so this is definitely a situation where the index set makes more sense to be the positive integers as opposed to the entire set of natural numbers. Because as the formula requires division by n, we really can't divide by zero. Um, that would be that would be problematic. But then of course, like I said before, we could always rewrite this. So instead of that, our formula could look like e to the n plus one over n plus one. That way, n could be drawn from any natural number, zero included. Now, of course, it makes the formula a little bit more complicated, but it did it then allowed us to start at zero. So that really comes down to style at that point, right? Do I want to do the whole set of natural numbers and have a slightly more complicated formula? Or do you want a more simpler formula and just have a more restrictive index set? Um, it's perfectly fine. You can do either one, not a big deal. And then one other example here, let's take an example of what we call an alternating sequence because the signs change between positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. So it was positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. So here we have the alternating harmonic sequence right here. The harmonic sequence is the sequence uh, of terms of the form one over n. And again, generally we'll denote, that'll be indexed by just the positive integers because we don't want to divide by zero. Um, it's alternating because it has this negative uh, factor in there. So negative one to a power. But this is where things get a little bit awkward here. If you want to start being positive and then move to negative or which depending on, you might have to have an n plus one as opposed to an n. Remember that even powers of negative one are positive and odd powers of negative one are uh, odd powers are negative. And so if you want the series to start, the sequence to start with a positive term, but your index is odd, you have to switch it to an even number. And so that can make a little bit of awkwardness, but we can deal with it, no big deal. So again, I wanted to mention this alternating sequence as an important family of sequences uh, worth mentioning. Many of these we probably have seen in previous classes, uh, maybe like Calculus 2, for example, is a common place where these sequences might have found the light of day. Now, the general, the general term is a really good way of describing a sequence, but it turns out another very useful way of describing a sequence is the notion of recursion. That is, we can define a sequence recursively. A recursive sequence means that the terms in a sequence are actually determined by previous terms. So predecessors help you determine uh, what the elements of a sequence are going to be. So let me give you an example of such a recursive sequence. Um, for which case, let's take a sequence. We're going to write the first couple terms of the sequence. We're going to take S sub 0, and we're going to say that's equal to 1. You can think of this as, you know, the seed of the recursive sequence. Sometimes people refer to it as the initial case, uh, the initial term. Another term that's very common to use here, especially with its respect to induction, this can be referred to as the base case. Uh, like I said at the beginning of this video, recursion and induction are basically doing the same thing, even though they look a little bit differently. Um, and as such, you have to have some initial value to get the sequence started. And this serves as the same reason that we check the base case in an induction proof right here. So you have some initial value, some base case that you have to deal with. And so this tells you how the sequence gets started. And then you have some type of what we call recursive relation. So an equation that tells you how the next term in the sequence is defined using its predecessor. So when you're at the nth term of the sequence, you compute this by taking four times the previous term in the sequence. So if I wanna start listing terms in the sequence, I can do so. The first term should be pretty easy because it was given to us explicitly. So S sub zero is equal to one. Now to compute S one by the recursive formula, what we do is we're gonna take four times S zero. Now S zero was itself one, so you get four times one, which is equal to one. Then for the next term, S two, this is computed as four times S1. As we just computed, S1 is itself four. Four times four is equal to 16. So that's the next term in the sequence. 
if I wanted to do S3, S3 is equal to 4 times S2, which S2 was 16. 4 times 16 is then going to equal 64. And if we do one more of these, S4 is equal to 4 times S3. S3 was 64, so we're going to get 4 times 64, which gives us 256. Now, at this point in the sequence, we might be starting to recognize a pattern. Because uh, when I look at these terms, 1, 4, 16, 64, 256, these appear to be powers of 4. You have the 0th power of 4. Um, I should say, sorry, this is the 0th power of 4. This is 4 to the 1st. This is 4 squared. This is 4 cubed. This is 4 to the 4th. And so it's very reasonable to conjecture that the general form of this sequence is Sn equals 4 to the n. And one can actually prove such a thing. This is an example of a geometric sequence, again. And it turns out that geometric sequences can be defined recursively. Uh, because if you take this recursive relation right here and rewrite it, what this tells you is that S n divided by Sn minus 1 is equal to 4. And this is often referred to with the geometric sequence as the common ratio. Uh, so a geometric sequence is typically defined uh, recursively and so that the ratio of consecutive terms in, a, in this geometric sequence is always the same number, hence why we call it the common ratio. And so this sequence always grows by a factor of four, and that's going to have the consequence that you can argue that if, if it recursively always grows by a factor of four, you're going to have this exponential growth right here, and this gives us an example of a geometric sequence. And so a sequence could be defined recursively, but it's possible that you can change from recursive definition into a, probably not that one, into a general term. And that can be very useful because the major hiccup about recursion is that if I want to calculate the 100th term of my sequence, well, sure, it's going to be four times the 99th term. But if I don't know that yet, I'm going to get four times four times the 98th term. In some respect, you have to move backwards. Like That's what I was saying earlier. If you're at the 100th term, you have to then calculate the 99th term, the 98, 97. You have to know all these previous terms in order to calculate the 100th term if you do it recursively. Of course, if you have... If you have a general formula, then we know that what the 100th term will just be 4 to the 100th power. We can we don't need all the predecessors if we have the general term. Uh, but again, it does make sense to use a, um, a recurs recursive sequence here because it depends on the previous term, sort of like a dynamical system. The next term is dependent upon its previous term. Let's look at another example of a recursive sequence that we've actually explored already in this lecture series. Let's take, for example, the factorial sequence. Uh, we defined it using the terminology, well, we first said that 0 factorial is equal to 1. That sort of felt like an exception because uh, the general formula was something more like the following. n factorial equals n times n minus 1 times n minus 2. And then you continue down all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1. And so we had to treat zero factorial as if it was somewhat different because this formula didn't seem to apply. You can't take all the product of numbers from zero down to one because you actually go, you have to go up to one from zero. But it turns out the factorial sequence has a very natural recursive formula. Zero factorial equals one, like we mentioned. And then for the general term, what you do is you take n factorial and that's equal to n times n minus one factorial. Okay, so you just take n times the previous factorial there. And so if we were to compute terms in this sequence, well, you get 0 factorial, which is equal to 1. That's our base case. You get 1 factorial. By the recursive formula, this is going to be 1 times 0 factorial. 0 factorial is 1. So you get 1 times 1, which is 1. Uh, then for the next one here, 2 factorial. This, by recursion, is 2 times 1 factorial. 1 factorial is equal to 1, so you end up with a 2 right there. Um, if we do 3 factorial... This is the same thing as 3 times 2 factorial. 2 factorial, of course, is equal to 2. And so we get 3 times 2, which is equal to 6. Um, let's do a few more here. 4 factorial is the same thing as 4 times 3 factorial. 3 factorial is equal to 6. 
uh, in which case four factorial is 24 in that situation. We'll do one more example here, five factorial. Recursively, five factorial is the same thing as five times four factorial. Four factorial turned out to be 24, and five times 24 is then 120. And so, yes, the factorial sequence itself is recursive, and we can often go back and forth between a recursive version of a sequence and a non-recursive version. There are advantages and strengths uh, and disadvantages to both the approaches. All right, um, I probably want to refer, in this video definitely, I want to refer to the most famous of all recursive sequences, and this is what's known as the Fibonacci sequence. So the Fibonacci sequence is important for many reasons, but for our purposes, um, there's actually a, a cool thing about the Fibonacci sequence. Unlike the other sequences we've seen so far, the Fibonacci sequence actually has two base cases. So we have F0 is equal to 0. We also have that F1 is equal to 1. And we take those two base cases. Um, and why do we need two base cases here? And it turns out for the Fibonacci sequence, the recursion in play here actually depends on the two immediate predecessors. So if we want to calculate the nth term of the Fibonacci sequence, we actually take the sum of the n minus one term and the n minus two term. So we take the sum of the two previous Fibonacci numbers, and that then gives you the next Fibonacci number here. And that's why we need these two base cases, because I need zero and one established so that I can do two. Two will be the sum of F0, F1, and so let's see exactly that. So using this recursive relation, we can then compute the first couple terms of the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, so the F0 term, we definitely should be able to get because it was provided to us. Likewise, F1, there's no failure we can make there because we don't have to compute anything that was told to us. But what about F2? Well, like I mentioned earlier, F2 is going to equal the sum of F1 plus F0, for which F1 was 1, F0 is 0, so the sum in which case is 1. Okay, F3. F3, by definition, is F2 plus F1, and so we end up with 2 plus 1, which is equal to 3. We get F4, which is F3 plus F2, so we end up with 3 plus 2, which is equal to 5. Um, F5 would equal F4 plus F3, which is equal to 5 plus 3, which is equal to 8. And with this, we can keep on going and going and going. F6 is then the sum of the previous two terms. We get 8 plus 5, which is equal to... Um, 13 in that situation. Uh, we can do F7. F7 is going to equal 13 plus 8, uh, which is going to give us 21. And we can keep on going and going and going. If we look at the terms in our sequence, we get 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, uh, 13, 21, these are the ones we've done so far. The next one, you would take 21 plus 13, which is 34. Uh, you would then, for the next one, you take 34 plus 21, which is 55. You would then get for the next one, you would take 55 plus 34, which is 89. And for the next one, you would take 89 plus 55, which is 144. And you would keep on going and going and going. And so this... Uh, the Fibonacci sequence, very famous uh, for lots of reasons. One, for example, its connection to the golden ratio. Um, and again, there's a lot of interesting applications uh, to the to, uh, applications of the Fibonacci sequence, none of which we'll go into right now in this conversation right here. But this Fibonacci sequence has this very simple, very simple recursion, involves two of the previous terms, like I said, very famous sequence. Uh, now, if you are curious, is it possible to come up with a non-recursive formula for the Fibonacci sequence? It turns out it, 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 you can. Um, the method of developing this formula, this is known as Beignet's formula, um, goes beyond the scope of this lecture series. Uh, but it turns out you can show that the nth term of the Fibonacci sequence is equal to 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2 raised to the nth power. Um, just so you're aware, this number right here is that golden ratio uh, that I mentioned earlier. This shows you one of the connections. Then you have to subtract from it uh, the conjugate of the golden ratio, also raised to the nth power. And then divide that thing by the square root of 5. And so it's like, wow, that is... That's a pretty that's a pretty fun number right now. I mean, this is an irrational number. This is also an irrational number. This is an irrational number. And sure enough, as you start taking this to natural number exponents, this will always turn out to be 
whole numbers and in fact reproduces this sequence right here. In some situations, the general formula might be so complicated that it's actually not as practical as the recursion itself. Now, by all means, if you're looking for like um, f to the you know, very large power, right? Like 10,000 or something like that. Maybe, maybe this would be advantageous to you, but honestly, the recursion is not so bad after all. Uh, but like I said, Binet's formula right here, uh, how one actually proves this, uh, we're not, we're not going to spend much time talking about, it, but be aware that the, finding the general formula of a recursive sequence in general can be a very difficult thing. But honestly, how does one prove anything about a recursive sequence at all? Because uh, after all, if each of these terms depend on their predecessors, how can I say anything about the general term if I don't know anything about the predecessors? Well, we have to investigate who the predecessors are, what properties they are there. And this is actually where we connect to what we've been talking about. Proving things about recursive sequences typically comes down to induction, because much like an induction proof, a recursive sequence has the similar structure. We have some type of base case or base cases if there's multiple things. And then this recursion is kind of like our inductive step there, that if we know something about the predecessors, we know the predecessors have the property, then the recursive relation then means that that property is then uh, given to the next term of the sequence as well. So let me show you an example of such a thing. Let's provide a proof by induction of a property about the uh, Fibonacci numbers. So consider the following sum. If you take the sum of F1 plus F2 plus F3 all the way up to Fn, this is equal to Fn plus 2 minus 1. So these each Fs are the Fibonacci numbers. So if you take the first Fibonacci number plus the second Fibonacci number plus the third Fibonacci number, uh, add that up to the nth Fibonacci number. That is to say, if you take the sum of all the Fibonacci numbers up to Fn, that's actually equal to the n plus second Fibonacci number minus one. Uh, you'll notice in this sum, I, I, I omitted the F zero here. That's because it's zero itself. Uh, but if you, if you feel dissatisfied by that in my sum, I did include K equals zero. Um, so it's in there, but clearly adding zero doesn't do much. We can very easily prove this by induction about the Fibonacci sequence here. So note, uh, we want to check the base case. So I'm going to check the case when n e itself equals zero. So if you take the sum where K ranges from zero to zero of F sub K, the only term you get there is F zero, which of course is equal to zero. On the other hand, if you take F n plus two minus one, um, if n equals zero, you're looking at F two minus one. As we showed previously, F two is itself one, one minus one is equal to zero. And so this proves the base case that this sum property does start somewhere. It starts at K equals zero. So for the sake of induction, we're going to assume that the sum of F1 through Fk is equal to Fk plus 2 minus 1. That's our inductive hypothesis. Now we want to consider what happens if we take our sum and we add up F1 all the way up to Fk plus 1. Fk plus 1 is the term after Fk. Fk is where we made our assumption for the sake of induction there. Now, because of the previous uh, inductive hypo hypothesis there, we know that the sum of the first k terms is equal to fk plus one, fk plus two minus one, excuse me. Um, and so we can re reduce that formula, or that is we can apply the inductive hypothesis to get this equality right here. But then I'm gonna rearrange terms. Um, so I'm gonna put fk plus one plus fk plus two minus one. So just stick the negative one by itself and put the two Fibonacci numbers together. Now, wait a second, I have two Fibonacci numbers. These are consecutive Fibonacci numbers by the recursion of Fibonacci numbers, fk plus 1 plus fk plus 2 is equal to fk plus 3. And let me emphasize here that fk plus 3, k plus 3, is actually k plus 1 plus 2. So for the instance of k plus 1 as our index, this then satisfies the formula. We've completed the inductive step, and therefore the formula follows by induction. And so what I then want to illustrate here with this Fibonacci sequence in this proof is that recursion and induction basically are the same thing. They're two sides of the same coin. Um, we can define sequences using recursion and we can improve things about that recursion using induction. So anytime someone does something with recursion, they're using the principle of mathematical induction, whether they know it or not. And anytime you do anything with induction, you honestly could change it into an argument using recursion. The two notions from a mathematical point of view are completely equivalent, recursion and induction.